Uh, it's good to see all of you again tonight as we continue our journey through the book of Mark. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll hop into the world behind the text for today. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be gathered together once again tonight. We're thankful that we have your word for us, and that we can encounter you through these stories, through these teachings that your son Jesus gives to us, and that we can learn more of who we are supposed to be and, and what you want us to do with this life that you have given to us. <clears throat> and so, God, as we read, we ask that you help illuminate and inspire and show us um, who we are and, and how you want us to live. And so, God, we give you this time, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so a quick review of where we've been so far. From the get-go, Mark has let us know that this is the good news about Jesus, who is the King, the Son of God, and He is the embodiment of good news. His presence here on this planet is good news for humanity. Through the first section of the book of Mark, in, in which we are still finding ourselves, uh, Jesus is ministering. He's, his ministry uh, is uh, about healing people. It's about casting out demons, forgiving folks, and teaching. And in particular, he does a lot of his teaching through parables. And then uh, he has sent out his closest followers. They've been empowered to minister to others, and they like him, have the ability to heal and cast out demons and teach. And yet, they still don't fully understand who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing. And that's going to come up once again in our texts for tonight. As we move into the world behind the text, I want to look again at things that are happening within the Bible as a whole. And uh, an area of study for biblical scholars called intertextuality. And essentially that's a big fancy, fancy word for cross-references within the Bible. And that's the image that you see up on the screen. This symbolizes over 60,000 cross-references that are happening within the Bible. In fact, if you want to know specifically, 63,779 cross-references that are all clear within the King James Version of the Bible. Um, I would argue there's probably even more cross-references than that. These are just like the really specific ones that the KJV points out. But as we've been seeing, as we've been journeying through Mark, there are times where Mark will allude to multiple stories at the same time. And sometimes those allusions are not as clear as other times. For example, there's times where he specifically says, Isaiah says, blah, 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 blah. That allusion is clear. But there are other times where he may be very broadly alluding to a story from the Hebrew scriptures. And we'll see more of that tonight. Now, who was um, the inventor of that beautiful thing? Yeah, yeah, I will let you know. Okay, this was a project done, um, started in 2007 by a couple of guys. The first one's name was Chris Harrison and his uh, helper, Christoph Romhilt. And what they were trying to do was develop a data set of all of the cross-references within the Bible. As they started their research, they recognized, oh, there's 63,779. Putting that on one document would be very difficult to do. So they shifted their approach to a more graphic kind of beautiful way of representing those cross-references rather than just a, a spreadsheet that points them all out. And so as you look at this, you see different colors here. That represents how far apart the references are in the biblical story. So the, the yellow colors and the green colors, they're, they're further references apart. The blues and purples are really close references. So like even references within the same book, those are blue ones. And then in the middle, you have some reds and pinks and things. Those are references to things that are uh, you know, a, a little ways across the Bible, but not all the way across. So um, 
Each book of the Bible is represented by the different color, white and gray shades that you see here. And then each chapter of the Bible is represented by a bar. The longer the chapter, the longer the bar is. So you see this bar right here in the middle. This is the longest chapter of the Bible. That's Psalm 119. Okay. Um, so there's all sorts of different lengths of biblical chapters. And then the graphic represents the first book of each testament with white. So Genesis is over here in white, and then Matthew is over here in white. And I want to zoom in on Mark just for a moment to show you a little bit more clearly some of the references happening within Mark. As I zoom in, you might be able to tell. I know it's kind of hard to tell because of how convoluted it is, but there are a lot of references happening in Mark, as with every book of the Bible. So Mark is this gray section, this gray section right here. And all, you see all these little blue interconnections are all happening within Mark itself. And then you see some connections between Mark and the other Gospels. And then you can faintly see the purple and the pinks and a little bit of red that is coming out of Mark. Most of those links are going to the Old Testament. And what book in particular has Mark been referencing a lot of? Isaiah. Isaiah, yes. And Genesis too, certainly. But we've had a lot of Isaiah. Um, and so a lot of those little pink and red lines, which are kind of hard to make out on the TV screen, those are going to Isaiah. So I want to show you this to show you that this is really common within the Bible. All these authors are referring to each other all the time and making allusions to one another. And it's clear that they're doing this for multiple reasons. One, to highlight themes and purposes that different books and different writings share. And then two, likewise, the narrative. They're connecting the narratives of previous writings to writings in the current period. So whether it's Isaiah referring back to the Genesis creation account, or Mark referring to Isaiah, or Revelation referring all the way back to Genesis, which is why you see those big yellow lines all the way across, we have all sorts of cross-references and intertextual um, allusions to one another throughout the Bible, not just in Mark. Okay? So our homework is we're supposed to draw that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. And we use crayon. Yeah, yes. crayon, colored pencils. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So, yeah, that's intertextuality. Uh, within the Bible. If, by the way, if you want to find this graphic on the internet, um, just do a Google search for Bible cross-reference image, and this will probably be the first thing that comes up. It's become somewhat popular. In fact, I'm so taken by it, I bought it. Um, I bought it as a digital image. You can get it for free, uh, but I bought the high-quality, high-definition image to show you, which this TV still did okay. Yeah. yeah. And then I actually bought a poster to put in my office. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. 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 Yep. So uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks it'll be here and maybe I'll show it to you. Uh, so. This right here, this line, that's Psalm 119. So what this is um, showing, this whole graphic, is showing all of the cross-references within the Bible. That's all of these arced lines. And then all of these um, bars are chapters in the Bible. So each different shaded gray section is a different biblical book. So you have Genesis here and Exodus, Leviticus, and so on and so forth. So this very long section, that's the Psalms. 
And this really long chapter is the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, all right. Let's hop into our text for tonight. Uh, We're starting at verse 45 of chapter 6. Immediately preceding this, we have the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Um, And if you were here last week, or if you watched the video, I probably gave you some new ideas to think about regarding that story. Uh, Namely, that it seems like Mark is alluding to the sense in which the crowd of people there is an army, that they are getting ready to fight, and they are getting ready to take on their Roman oppressors. And so they are waiting for a Messiah to come along and lead them into that fight. Um, And then Jesus satisfies them to the point that they are no longer all that interested in fighting, as we will see in this early part of this first section that we're looking at. So uh, I'm going to read Mark 6, starting with verse 45 through the end of the chapter. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake, and he was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. So, we've had this fascinating and wonderful miracle where Jesus feeds 5,000 men. They're cared for, and then it seems as though their desire to go and fight, it it no longer exists. And so Jesus is able to dismiss them. He just says, you can go home. And as he does so, his disciples hop in a boat. They are about to go back across the lake, and he decides that he's going to go up on the mountain to pray. Now, uh, Mark doesn't tell us how this is the case, but it seems as though Jesus has some sort of supervision because in the middle of the night, he is able to see from a mountain his disciples in the middle of a lake straining against the wind. Now, you may recall from the previous time that the disciples were out on the lake, there's a big squall, a storm pops up. The sense in this story isn't so much a storm, it's a wind that has kind of just pushed them adrift. It's not quite as strong as the previous experience. Uh, But they're straining against it, and so he decides he's gonna, with his apparently super speed, uh, go (laughs) down the mountain and then start walking across the lake. Uh, And then Mark even says, not that he was going to go out and rescue them, he's actually about to pass by them, go right on by and meet them on the other side of the lake. Uh, But when they see him, they think he's a ghost. Now, uh, they would likely think he's a ghost because he's out on the water. 
And we've talked about this some. We really talked about it a lot in the Genesis class, the sense in which when you're out on standing water, so lakes and seas, this is as close as you are on the earth to under the earth, the depths, the abyss, where all evil spirits and things like that come from. So it's this connection point between the dead and the living. That's why they naturally think, oh, it's a ghost. The ghost has come out of the depths, and they're going to haunt us. And not walking in the dark on the water. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Not like you see a whole bunch of humans walking out on the water in the lake, yeah, yeah. So they think he's a ghost, and he says, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid, it will be okay. Um, this, I mentioned he's, he's about to pass by, um, that is another biblical allusion, so another cross-reference here. Um, in the Old Testament, we have a couple of allusions to God passing by people as a way of showing them who he is. It's a, a way of identifying himself. So you have the story in Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 and 6, where God passes by Moses. Moses is in the cleft of a rock, and he can only see the backside of God as God passes by. And then again in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11, similar story where God passes by Elijah. So when Mark uses this language of passing by, he is referring to those stories and is suggesting that Jesus, just as God appeared to Moses and Elijah, he is passing by to show the disciples his divine nature and identity. Okay. And is this the story where Peter gets out of the boat? Or is that yet another time on the way, or did Mark just not? Mark did not include that okay. part of the narrative. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, um, I can't even remember which gospel or gospels that's in, but that doesn't seem to be a detail that Mark cares so much about. Yeah, good question. Good question. Yeah. So he's about to pass by. They think he's a ghost, and so they, they're they scared. But he says to them, Ego a me." It is I. Once again, in the Old Testament, when you see it is I or it is me or something similar to that, um, that's an allusion to God referring to himself. Okay, think of Moses and the burning bush story. I am who I am. It's a similar sort of idea that Mark is alluding to here. Okay. So he's alluding to himself as divine. He climbs into the boat, and then what do you know? The wind dies down, and they are completely amazed, uh, in part because they still don't understand who Jesus is. And that's why Mark makes the reference in verse 32 to their hearts being hardened and not understanding about the loaves. They should have seen in the feeding of 5,000 story that, oh, this isn't just some human being. Nobody can just make food appear. This is God. And yet they still haven't really wrapped their minds around that possibility. So Mark says their hearts were hardened. In other words, they just weren't ready to receive that, um, that truth yet. So then um, in verses 53 through 56, we get this short passage that concludes this entire section, not just the story on the lake, but this whole story of Jesus out in um, Gentile territory. Um, so they've crossed back over into Jewish territory in Gennesaret. They anchor there, and as soon as he gets out of the boat, people recognize 
who he is, as opposed to his own disciples who are in the boat with him. They see that there is something about him that is miraculous, if not outright divine. And so they run through the whole region, get all their sick people, and bring them to wherever he is. And they beg him to heal them and to simply even touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touch it were healed. And that's where we get this, this great Greek word that shows up all over the place. It's already been in Mark, um, but this is the first time that I really wanted to highlight it with you all. Sozo is the word that the NIV translates as healed here, but it's also the same word for saved. So in the biblical imagination, particularly in the New Testament, although this is true in the Hebrew scriptures as well, healing and salvation are very similar, if not identical, concepts. To be saved is to be healed of something, right? So in, in the case of these folks who are suffering physically, they're being physically healed. They're also physically being saved, often from death, if not just their sickness and illness, right? Uh, but it also refers to spiritual illness, sin, and brokenness in their lives. And so God brings about healing for that, and it is also salvation. So this term is used interchangeably to be defined as healed or salvation. English has a couple of different words, but in Greek, sozo is referring to um, either of those ideas. So just crossed the lake and it's been healing a bunch of people. And then we get to chapter 7, and our first interaction with the Pharisees uh, in a little while, <laughs> the last time we interacted with the Pharisees, uh, at the end of that, they start uh, rallying and plotting with the Herodians to kill Jesus. Um, so this story is significant. Uh, so I'm going to read 1 through 23 here in chapter 7. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And then Mark gives us this little note. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So then Mark continues the narrative. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law ask Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your own tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Uh, and then NIV actually doesn't have verse 16. I'll talk about why that's the case uh, in a minute. 
And so then verse 17, after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of their body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Okay, so let's walk through some of the things happening here in the first part of chapter 7. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law come along. They see that the disciples are eating food, but they have not ceremonially cleansed themselves. They are quite nice. Or rather, what they're doing is, or a part of them is, as in their hands, they're defiled or unclean. And they, they mean this um, in a ritual sense. So then Mark actually does a little bit here to try and explain what's going on, which is really helpful. Um, and so it seems to be the case that he must be writing to some Gentile people because Jewish people would have known all about what this means. <clears throat> um, so during this time, um, one of the things that's happening in Judaism is that all of these different sects and all of the teachers within the sects are all debating about how you're supposed to live out the commands of God, in particular, the, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. And so they have all of these oral arguments they have with one another that get passed down from generation to generation. Um, some of them will even get written down. Uh, they're starting to do that in this time period, but most of that comes along a little bit later <clears throat> in Jewish history. And these oral traditions of interpreting what's happening in the Old Testament become really significant aspects of Jewish life. Um, and in particular for the Pharisees, they believed following these oral teachings and interpretations of the Hebrew scriptures are part of how you become a holy person, a set-apart person that identifies with God and with the people of God. And so they care a great deal about all of these rules. And one of the rules that comes along uh, is tied to ceremonial washing. Now, Leviticus actually has rules about ceremonial washing. Um, in fact, a whole bunch of rules about <clears throat> ceremonial or ritual, I mean those two things synonymously, uh, being ritually unclean or clean and, and ceremonially unclean or clean, and how to get from an unclean state to a clean state. And so Leviticus itself has a bunch of rules for how to go about that it, that include cleansing. But things get added to those rules, and that's part of what Jesus is referring to here. So for example, in Leviticus, it says that the priests are supposed to do ceremonial washing, but the um, Pharisees believed that because the Israelites were a priesthood, the whole nation, a priesthood that's trying to show the world who God is, they said that everyone needs to follow these rules. And we can actually see from archaeology that um, there are all these ceremonially, ceremonially cleansing stations that have been created around Galilee at this time period so that people can ceremonially cleanse themselves when they have come into an unclean state. Now, how do they come into an unclean state in their point of view? It's by interacting with 
something or someone that is unclean. And immediately prior to this story, we've got Jewish people in Gentile territory, so they're unclean. And in particular, the, that small section, 53 through 56 of chapter 6, talks about people who are sick and diseased. Those are all ceremonially unclean people. And they are brought to the marketplace, which tends to have all sorts of people from all sorts of different places. So the possibility of becoming unclean is quite high in the marketplace. So there's all these interactions that Jesus and his disciples are having that in the pharisaical mindset would make them unclean. And so they observe this happening and they see the disciples don't ceremonially wash their hands prior to eating. And so they make a big deal about it. And Mark even goes on to say, it's not even just about washing hands. They also observe other traditions about washing cups and pitchers and kettles and anything that is associated with making food needs to be cleansed. And so they ask out of their mindset about how you're supposed to live as a holy person. They ask Jesus, why aren't you holding to the tradition of the elders, those oral teachings that we have passed down about eating food properly? And Jesus uh, is quite strong in his response when he says, Isaiah was right about you hypocrites. And so Jesus' response conveys through the words of Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, uh, that they are giving way too much credence to these oral interpretations and teachings, and they have actually neglected the core of the Torah. It's as if because they've spent so much time trying to interpret all the little details, they've missed the forest through the trees. Their obsession with the complexity has blinded them to what really matters. And so they get obsessed about certain rules and then neglect others. So that's when in verse 9 through 13, he gives an example of how they are doing this. Uh, so in the Ten Commandments, I mean, that is the core of Jewish law. They are told they should honor their father and mother. And uh, Exodus chapter 21, verse 17 goes on to say, not only should you honor your father and mother, but if you don't, that anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But then Jesus brought, brings up um, a teaching that is going around amongst the Pharisees and other Jews that if people dedicate some sort of possession, namely um, property. If they dedicate that to the Lord and to the temple, then that is declared as what's called korban. So in Greek, it's with a K, but in English with a C. And Mark pretty much defines what that means. It's devoted to God. So apparently what was happening <clears throat> in certain cases where people were donating land or property or um, possessions to the temple and um, they were doing so as a way of showing their piety, but it was actually a way that they could avoid caring for their aging parents. Um, by the way, th this is... a. a, a a side note, but it's very related because it's essentially what Jesus is referring to here. The command to honor your father and mother isn't just about when you're a child and you should obey your parents when they are when you're a young person. Actually, I, I think a lot of biblical scholars would argue that the greater emphasis of the Old Testament is that you're supposed to honor your parents when they're old. You are to care for them as they age um, and make sure that they are taken care of, that um, even as they become frail, that they are still looked at with honor um, 
and treated with respect and dignity. And so this was a way in dedicating property as Corbin given to God. This is a way people could actually avoid the Ten Commandments, this particular command in particular, honoring their father or mother. Why? Probably out of some sort of spite or um, anger toward their parents. Um, but this is Jesus showing about how they have got so caught up in all of these oral traditions that they're neglecting the core of God's commands in the Hebrew scriptures. So why would giving all of their stuff away then, I mean, wouldn't they still take care of their parents even though they've given all their stuff away? So the, the idea is that um, because they have given away all of their possessions or property, they don't have the means of taking care of their parents. They only have enough to care for their own immediate family. And, they, and, and it's a way of saying, oh, I, aren't I so pious that I gave all of this to God and to the temple um, when it's a wink, wink, now I don't have to care for my aging parents. Right, exactly. Yeah. And the Pharisees seem to be okay with this. They go along so with this the idea. Well, the Pharisees probably know. The, the temple folks will. Yeah. So the Levites and, and those working in the temple. But, but certainly uh, because they're the ones who are kind of propping up the tradition, it's a way that they are still viewed as um, authorities and so it definitely props up their power, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Jesus, very upset about this, um, and then says to the crowd, listen to me and understand this, that nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. This is pretty new teaching for them. Um, even within the Old Testament, the understanding that you can be defiled or become unclean by things outside of you is pretty prevalent, especially within Leviticus. Um, and so G this is pretty radical stuff right here. Um, and then uh, it gets even more radical later when uh, Mark says that in this, Jesus declares all foods clean. That is one of the primary ways that Jews distinguish themselves from Gentiles and set themselves apart as holy by their food laws. And so Mark, through Jesus, saying that all foods are clean is very revolutionary. And that would have really, really pushed some people, Jewish people in particular, to the edge. However, it is a way in which Jesus is trying to communicate the core of what Hebrew holiness law is really about. What defiles a person, he says, this is starting in verse 20, is not what touches them from outside, but what comes out from within. And so then he gives this list. Um, this is called a vice list. Um, it was really common in the first century for people to write lists of um, either virtues or vices or a combination of both uh, that they felt like were ethical standards for the people to whom they were writing. And so Jesus is giving ethical standards right here for God's people. These are the vices that we should avoid. And this is not all of them. It's a, it's a list of specific ones that Jesus is certainly concerned about, but this is a representative list and more things could be a part of it. This is not exhaustive. Um, so he specifically says sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Um, I don't want to take time to go through each one of those individually. Most of them are pretty self-explanatory, uh, but the context for a couple of these is noteworthy. Um, one, of one, one of them is the word envy. Literally, the Greek there is an evil eye. Mine says evil eye. Yes, an evil eye. In other words, that your sight 
for something that doesn't really belong to you is turned in on itself. It is not good. It is evil. And so your desire inwardly for something that does not belong to you um, is defilement. Um, and then folly. Folly is more than just foolishness. Sometimes we think of those two things synonymously in English and in Western culture. Um, it's a little bit stronger than that. It's a sense in which not only do they not know what they should know, they don't care. And they're just fine with that. They're, and they're intent with going about their merry way, doing whatever evil or nefarious things come to their mind. That is folly. So this is, this is pretty big teaching right here. This is really the first time we see Jesus go, I mean, almost flip a 180. Um, it is an upside down reality in which he is describing um, what it means to be holy and ritually clean or pure. Um, this is not how Jewish people would have typically thought about it at the time. Um, but it absolutely revolutionizes um, our understanding of holiness and um, is a core aspect of how we think about the interior life as followers of Jesus as opposed to Jewish folks. And then uh, just really quickly before I move on to the next section, I mentioned verse 16 that in uh, the NIV and some of the other translations that you may have, verse 16 is essentially taken out. Uh, that's because the earliest manuscripts that we have in Greek actually don't have verse 16 in it. When the verse numbers were put in just a couple hundred years ago, by the way, did you know that verse numbers are not that old? Like the, the verse and chapter numbers were just put in a few hundred years ago? Yeah. They're not, well, in the grand scheme of, of Christian and Judeo history, uh, they're not that old. Um, so it seems as though um, what we would describe as verse 16 was put in a little while after the original writing that Mark did. Um, and it is the same words as chapter 4, verse 23 which is, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Okay. So some of your translations, so a little bit older translations like the King James Version, is there, it's still going to have verse 16 in it. In fact, I think the New King James also has verse 16 in it. Um, uh, RSV might have it in it still, a couple of others. Um, but newer translations typically don't because... Like I said, it's not in the very earliest manuscripts that we now have. It seems odd that the version that I have um, leaves it out, but also leaves the number out. So I have oh. verse 15. And, and then just verse 17. 17, yeah. But there's no explanation in the notes. It has all these notes telling me things, but never talks about why 16 is not there. Which translation do you have? A passion. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure why they left out that note. That's fascinating. I'll be curious. We're going to get to a fairly lengthy section at the end of Mark um, that there's actually two separate sections that get added in as later texts develop. I'm curious what the Passion Translation is going to do with those. Um, so make sure you bring that up when we get toward the end. That'll be literally the last class that we have. All right, <clears throat> so Jesus does this teaching about cleanliness, particularly ritual cleanliness, ceremonial cleanliness, um, and, and typically things that are not Jewish uh, have this, they're not outright unclean, but there's definitely an unclean sense to them. Uh, so right after this story, Jesus goes back to Gentile territory, okay? Uh, so I'm going to read, I'm actually going to read all the way to the end of chapter 7, uh, starting at verse 24. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. 
He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephaphatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. All right. So, right after this section where Jesus names what really makes people unclean or defiled, he goes into Gentile land to do some more ministry there. Um, and so, as he goes into Tyre, uh, and he has this interaction with this woman, uh, we should start to think about another story from the Bible that happens in this same region. Uh, it's the story of Elijah and the widow and her son at Zarephath. Zarephath is actually in the same region as Tyre and Sidon. And so, so some allusions that Mark is making to that story. And in that story, uh, there's a widow who is running out of food. And so Elijah shows up. He says, make me some food. Oh, I don't have very much left. I, in fact, all I've got left is to make one meal for my son and I, and then after that, we're going to die. And then Elijah says, no, God is going to provide for you as long as you make this meal for me. So he goes and stays with her for a while, and God continues to bless them with food. And not long after that, the son gets sick, and he's about to die, and Elijah heals the son through the power of God at work in and through him. So that story is in the background of this story uh, here with Jesus. Uh, so Jesus goes into... Um, he goes into Tyre, um, and he just apparently finds some random house, and he goes into it. Uh, uh, so we're talking about uncleanness. This is like taboo. Certainly you shouldn't just walk into some Gentile person's house, and yet he does. Uh, he's already been in Gentile land, and there have been people from Tyre and Sidon who've come to Galilee to see what he's doing, so news about him spreads. They can't keep it a secret. And so as soon as she hears about him, this woman with the little daughter possessed by an impure spirit comes to him, falls at his feet. In verse 26, Mark makes sure to say, she is a Greek. She is a Gentile. And not only is she a Gentile, she's from that region of people that we really hate. The Syrians, the Phoenicians, ugh, they are the worst of the Gentiles. They're so unclean. Uh, yes, this, so there's an antagonistic relationship between Jewish people and Syrian Phoenician folks. So she begs Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. And then we have this 
a surface level, a very confounding interaction between Jesus and this woman. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Okay, so we're definitely working with some sort of metaphor here, but what is the metaphor? It seems as though he is saying that she, if not her people, are dogs. And that is an insult in the ancient world. In our world, we like doggies, <laughs> right? Doggies come into the house, we pet the doggies, they, they run and play fetch, they sleep in our beds. Uh, yeah, in the ancient world, mm -mm, not so much. Doggies are nasty creatures. Uh, they're scavengers. They they're, ugh, carry diseases around. People don't typically keep them as pets. Um, in fact, uh, I, I actually haven't watched The Chosen very much, but uh, for those of you who have, um, it's my understanding that The Chosen depicts Matthew as having a dog. Mm -hmm. Is that right? For those of you who watched it? Yeah, that's uh, really scandalous, actually. Pretty taboo. Um, and that's part of why he gets picked on, right? In The Chosen, he's kind of an outsider, uh, among other things, uh, because he has a dog. Um, yeah, probably not. Yes, exactly. Okay, so it's it's an insult certainly to call someone or refer to someone as a dog or dogs. Uh, so so the obvious question is: This seems totally out of character for Jesus. Why would he say this? This doesn't really make any sense. Particularly if what he is saying is that the Gentile people are dogs, and the Jewish people are the children. The children of Israel should be receiving all of Jesus's blessings, whereas the dogs, the Gentiles, shouldn't be receiving any of it. That, that seems to be what the metaphor is describing. Seems very harsh, very hostile. Uh, by the way, so this is another little side note here. When you see something in the Bible that you're like, that doesn't make any sense, you need to really pay attention to that. You need to really dive into that and figure out why is that the case that that doesn't make sense? Because there's a reason for it. And that's certainly the case here in Mark. Okay, so two possible interpretations um, from scholars. Well, there's many possible interpretations, but these are the two main ones that I want to point out. Why would Jesus say this to this woman? Uh, first thought or idea of how to interpret this is that this is Jesus' initial response to her. Because she's a Gentile, he is reflecting the Jewish ideas of the day. But it is her response to him that convinces him that, she, uh, that her request should be heeded and that he should care for her daughter. So that's one, one possible interpretation of what's going on here. The second is that it could be that Jesus is using irony for emphasis. So referring to the Jewish belief that these Gentile people are dogs and are undeserving, but he's doing it in a wink, wink, roll his eyes type of way. And that her response is her playing along with the irony that she's quite clever. And, and she then uses that ironic statement that Jesus makes to then turn it and reemphasize her request. Um, this is probably not going to surprise you. I lean toward that second understanding. Okay. Um, it, particularly because Mark does use irony quite a bit. Second, because it just seems so out of character for Jesus to this point, particularly because there are so much emphasis in this section about how the Gentiles are included into what Jesus is doing. They are some of the outsiders that are being brought in. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense within the context of Mark for Jesus to just upend everything that he's been doing regarding the Gentiles. So I think the irony is what should be 
played out here. And so I, I thought about how this would play out like in a movie or a TV show. And this is how I think it would go. She comes into the house and she begs Jesus, would you heal my daughter? And Jesus is like, well, you know. You know that it's the children who should eat first. It is not right for the children for their bread to be tossed away to dogs. Kind of roll his eyes, you know, kind of play into this tongue-in-cheek. And that she then catches this and plays long. <laughs> well, Lord, you know that the, the dogs get the crumbs under the table once in a while, don't you, Lord? And so Jesus picks up on this and appreciates it, it seems, and says, for your response, you may go, and the demon has left her body. That's how I think this scene is actually playing out. Um, a beautiful piece of storytelling by Mark that I think um, could be depicted really well on screen. Um, so if anyone wants to take me up on, on that, you can freely have that interpretation and run with it. Tell the chosen about it. That's fine. <laughs> However you want to do it. I'm good with that. need Jack Penny to play Jesus. Sure. Yeah, that, that'd be fine. Yeah. So you think she's you just... Yeah. her humility in a, in a kind of a bright, a lighthearted way. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. The conveying, yeah, her humility along with being clever and playing along with Jesus. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, She's saying, I'll take anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that is a possibility. That's one of the other, um, and, that, and that could be tied to the first possible interpretation that I mentioned. Um, so some scholars think that. I tend to lean away from that interpretation, but it's certainly possible. Well, yeah. I didn't like the first one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah. I would feel like, you know, she's got this child who's tormented and that she'd be more desperate instead of lighthearted about it. Like, the, like the word, even the dogs eat crumbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, help her. Please. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think that is, I think all of these aspects are probably all at play at the same sense, same time. There is an aspect of desperation, certainly. Um, she comes in begging, falls at his knees. I mean, these are signs of desperation. Also signs in which she recognizes his authority and his power to actually do something for her. Um, and yet the, the conversation conveys, and maybe lightheartedness isn't quite the right word, but certainly clever, certainly a sense in which she can pick up the irony really quickly and turn it uh, in a way that Jesus appreciates. Um, she has a lot of faith, too. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Because when he tells her to go. Yeah, she just goes. Uh, he doesn't ask Jesus to come and touch the kid. She believes that he can do it from there. Yep. And a lot of the other things where she, they, they always wanted him to come. come. Yep. Yep. Specimen, she, she... Great observation. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, yes, this is our first story in which Jesus heals someone from afar. Um, in, in Mark, to this point, it's they got to touch him or he has to touch them. Um, and this is a story that declares that, oh, Jesus' power extends well beyond his physical touch. Excellent, excellent point there, you Pat. Know, Pastor James, what yep. do you think, though, being a, a Gentile in that time, you would have to learn to kind of be coy a little bit or a little, like, be able to defend yourself with words where you're going to be kind of like, beating around the bush of their laws, yeah. their ideals. Yeah. And in fact, being coy or clever um, is generally speaking a virtue within ancient Near Eastern
contexts anyway. So in, in Jewish literature and in Jewish culture, that's certainly a good thing. And it seems like the surrounding Arab peoples would have seen that as such as well. And so in particular, as you're alluding to, when they have to interact with one another, you, you show your mental fortitude when you can be coy and clever with another person. Yeah, particularly of a different um, <coughs> cultural background than you are. Great observation. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, just quick side note, that's part of why um, Isaac is generally regarded as a positive character within the Bible. But you remember the beginning of the, um, oh, sorry, not Isaac, Jacob. Uh, the, the beginning of the Jacob and Esau story, he steals Esau's birthright. For us, we find that kind of offensive at first reading, but there's undertones of, oh, he's actually pretty clever to do that. And that's part of why he has a positive, generally, outlook within Scripture. Yeah. Great, great point. All right. So then... Um, after this interaction with this woman, uh, Jesus leaves Tyre and he goes to Sidon, which is nearby, and then down to the region of the Decapolis. Decapolis literally means ten cities, so it's a region where ten cities are all nearby. Um, and in this Decapolis region, people bring to him a man who is deaf and could hardly talk. Um, they beg Jesus to place his hand on him. So opposite the last story where Jesus doesn't have to be present, Jesus is present and in some markedly fascinating ways. Uh, we, <laughs> yeah. So he puts his fingers into the man's ears and then he spits. And it's unclear here where he's spitting. In fact, this is a, a topic of great debate amongst Mark and scholars, does he spit on the ground? Does he spit into his hands and then touch the man's tongue with his hands? Does he spit into the man's mouth? And the spit is what touches the tongue. We don't know. Mark isn't clear there. Um, My translation it says that he spit on his fingers. Right. Yeah, but that is, that is certainly an, an interpretation. The Greek is not clear there. It's, it's a little bit vague. Um, so we're not exactly sure if that's what These happened. These are all unclean gestures. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, you're picking it up. You're picking it up. Certainly, those are all unclean things that you should not typically do as a good Jewish man. However... Uh, what we also know, and we've talked a little bit about how in the ancient world there are these um, healers that go around from place to place and they make a big deal out of how they can heal people in all sorts of different ways. And they'd make these spectacles that often included, guess what, touching whatever part of the body had an ailment, and they often used spit as part of their, um, their little interaction with that person um, maybe yeah there's there's apparently from my reading a sense in which people thought that spit had healing properties in it um i don't know for sure right yeah yeah, yeah. um so um it could be it could be that that jesus is and I'm playing off of or mimicking these healers that are going around at that period of time. Um, but but in kind of, again, this kind of clever tongue-in-cheek way, because obviously he doesn't have to do that, and yet he does for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe. He was on a yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess so. I guess so. This version has okay. Jewish culture of Jesus' time was considered to have power to heal. Okay, so similar, yeah, yeah, that, but, but a bit more specific. Fascinating. I didn't read that. That's fascinating. Too, that he took them away from the people, so those spectacles were 
spectacle would not have been for the people. Bingo. Spirit. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly, that's part of why I think he's kind of mimicking and making fun of that whole thing. Because he pulls the man away, away from the crowd, and then does all of the rigmarole of it, well, but in a wink, eyes, wink. So yep, fine. yep, exactly, exactly. Exactly. And then he says, Ephaphatha, which uh, recall from a previous time, uh, he uses the common language of the people, whereas these healers would have used some sort of incantation, some other language or some made up language as part of their healing thing, like rub a dub dub and now you're fixed, you know, <laughs> um, whatever. He uses actual language, be opened, and at this the man's ears are opened his tongue loosened, and he begins to speak plainly. Um, so then Jesus commands him not to tell anyone. What? Well, heard that before. And the more he did that, the more people kept talking about it. Surprise, surprise. Yep, yep. Uh, and the people were overwhelmed with amazement at everything he was doing um, and even saying, he can make... Um, Deaf man hear and a mute man speak. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to chapter eight. Real quick. Can Go for it. I know it reminds you this was the first time that uh, Jesus was spoken to being as Lord. Oh, yeah. Great point. Great point. Yeah. So that's, that's back in the. Um, Story of the Syrophoenician woman, yeah, in verse 28, yeah. Um, in fact, there uh, not only is the word there, Lord, uh, some of the ancient manuscripts say, like, yes, Lord, or amen, Lord, there. Yeah, uh, great, great observation, yeah. So another sense in which people who are on the fringes, the outcasts, they see more clearly who Jesus is, than the people who are close to him. Uh, and we're going to see the opposite side of that right now. Chapter 8, starting with verse 1. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have splagnitzomai, compassion, for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? <laughs> How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. So he told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly I tell you, no sign will be given to it. And then he left them got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. Okay, so we should immediately see a bunch of similarities between this story of the feeding and the previous one that we covered last week. Um, so I want to name what some of those similarities are. First, Jesus has compassion on the people. They're in a remote location. The disciples have this question in which they're essentially helpless, but they're not actually. Jesus then questions the disciples. The number seven is present in both stories. The disciples distribute the food 
in both stories. The people are satisfied after they eat, and then there is a collection of leftovers. Notable differences. Uh, unlike the last story where there are 12 basketfuls of food afterward, this one has seven baskets full. Um, in the last one, we talked about how the number 12 signifies the nation of Israel. Uh, so it's a way that Mark is saying these are the gathered people of Israel. God, Jesus is bringing all the scattered people back together, and we are recommitting ourselves to God's covenants through Jesus and being his people, and that is being inaugurated in this meal. Number seven is the number of wholeness or completion. So there's a sense in which this meal is about completing the mission, the objective. It's beyond just the Jewish people who are part of God's people in, in a renewed way. Now it's about the Gentiles as it was always supposed to be. They are also included in God's salvific activity through Jesus, and it is being made whole, complete, as it is supposed to be. Um, you see that the number of people is a little bit different. In fact, remember, in the first story, it specifically says 5,000 men, um, and I talked about how that's a way that Mark is probably trying to tell us that this is an army of people, because he just says men. This time, it's 4,000 Men, women, children, anybody. Um, all, all sorts of people gathered there together. So in this case, um, this is not an army of people. This is just a crowd that has gathered together that is excited by what Jesus is doing um, and are listening to him teach and encountering his miraculous healing touch. Yep. Yeah. So that very possibly could be a foreshadowing to his death. Um, we're going to see another, just a little, little foreshadowing element in the, not the next story, but the one after that. So that, that yeah, great observation. Great observation. Um, so, just like though the first story of Jesus providing and um, feeding a large group of people, the people are all satisfied. Um, and so it seems the point of the story is that Mark is continuing the narrative of Jesus' salvation, that the Jews can be satisfied by Jesus, and so can the Gentiles. It is for everyone. And so then, uh, after that, they get in a boat, and they go back to the region of Dalmanutha. We're not exactly sure where that is, uh, but pretty confident it's in Galilee. So we're back in, in Jewish territory for... Just a moment. Uh, the Pharisees come again. Oh, that's good news. Uh, and they begin to question Jesus. Uh, and not just question, they parazontes him. What the NIV translates as test, to test. Um, we've had one other time where Jesus has been tempted so far, and Mark, who is the one doing that testing? Satan. Okay, so Mark is intentionally connecting Satan and what he's doing in the spiritual realm to what the Pharisees are doing in the physical. That Satan is trying to test Jesus to get him off course, and the Pharisees are doing that as well. No wonder the Pharisees Well, Mark definitely wants, and, and not at first. The way Mark describes them at first, they're kind of neutral characters, but as the, the narrative develops, they get more and more overtaken by the power of the Satan, Satan, at work energizing them to get rid of Jesus. Yeah. 
but it's important to note that Pharisees in and of themselves are not bad. Um, they're, a, they're actually, they're holiness people. And, and so Nazarenes in particular, we ought to pay close attention to the Pharisees and how they get themselves tripped up because we're actually really liable of similar things. They're legalistic. Nazarenes have had a history of legalism. Okay. Um, so we need to get back to the core of what holiness is about. That's part of what Jesus is trying to do, of course, in Mark and in general, is to help people to see that holiness is about living out the way that God wants you to live as a, a unique people reflecting God's holiness to the world around us, not so much caring about all the little individual details so much as that we are people filled with love for each other and the world around us that they might know about a God who, as Pastor Don mentioned yesterday, is completely other, utterly unique in a good way, not a bad way. So the Pharisees would have felt that they had the right to question and test him because of their order or whatever. Well, and in general Jewish structure, because it was common for religious leaders to have debates. It was, it was common for rabbis to have these sorts of conversations. It didn't matter what sect they what were from. What was their motive that went wacky? Because we're yes. to test mm -hmm. the spirits. Mm -hmm. But they have yeah, seen enough and heard enough by then to know that Jesus is who he says. Great point about testing the spirits. A little bit different context there. That testing the spirits is about us trying to discern where um, something is coming from to make sure, okay, this is God's Holy Spirit leading this, not some sort of evil or um, bad spirit. Um, this is a case in the context of Mark in which they are, yes, trying to trip him up, trying to Instead. get him off. Yes, thank you. Great word. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Yep, yep, good. Uh, so in that story, he, um, he sighs deeply. Uh, by the way, uh, this is the second time in just a little while where we've seen a deep sigh from Jesus. He does a deep sigh right before he heals. Is it the blind man? Have we done the blind man? No, the mute man. Yeah. Verse 34 of chapter 7. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephaphatha, which means be opened. Uh, so kind of fascinating that in two instances right near each other, there's this deep sigh from Jesus, which is the word, let's see if I can get it, Anastenaxis, Anastenaxis, yeah, Anastenaxis, yeah, well, I don't know. Common spelling. <laughs> deeped, it is deeped, deeply, and it's not just like, huh. It's like deep within his spirit is the sense. I'm encouraged by that because I feel like he's sighing because he, this is not how things are supposed to be. He's, yeah. Yeah, and when we're not exactly sure why the sigh, but the context makes it seem that he's exasperated by all this. <sighs> what? But would he have been exasperated with this? Probably not. So the context of that is probably more of a deep sigh as a sense of uh, receiving breath for power to enact. Or, or it's possible, again, because uh, he could be mimicking the other uh, folks that they had some sort of deep sighs as part of their, yeah. And may, maybe a little bit different types of sighs, yeah. Could the deep sigh also be not just, so you're saying like power from God for healing. Well, sometimes it's 
it's power from God just for patience. Sure, could be. Or control of an emotion. Yeah. Yeah, very, very possible. This is this is a, a an instance where we don't have a whole lot of clarity of what Mark means exactly, but certainly by what he says in reply, he's not real crazy about the Pharisees trying to test him. Um, but I think another case of irony here. Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Well, what has he been doing the whole time? There's all sorts of signs everywhere. So it's not that they don't have signs given to them. It's that, hello, open your eyes. Here they are, right in front of your face. So no sign will be given to them is a sense in which it's not that he's not doing them already. It's that they just don't have eyes to see or ears to hear what he's doing. Um, so then he has this interaction with the disciples. Sorry, sorry, I laugh. It's it's really quite humorous given the context. Uh, so he has this exasperated interaction with the Pharisees, and then we get to verse fourteen. Um, and I'm actually going to read all the way through verse twenty six. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Wait, what, what happened just a little bit ago where there was a lot of bread? Where did that come from? Anyway. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? And ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember, when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces of bread did you pick up? Twelve. Twelve. <laughs> they replied, and when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Seven, they answered. He said to them, do you still not understand? They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. <laughs> I'll get to that. <laughs> Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't go around the village. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you're... I can tell just from your laughter and the way that I told that story, you're picking up what Mark is laying down for us, right? We've just had a story where Jesus provides bread for uh, 4,000 people, not long before that, 5,000. And the disciples are worried that, oh, we only have one loaf. <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Seems they left them. Okay. Yeah. So Jesus is not altogether all that concerned about the loaves of bread. He's a little bit more concerned about this interaction he just had with the Pharisees. And so he says, be careful, watch out for the yeast, is the way that uh, NIV translates it. Yeast is actually um, anachronistic. Um, ancient people didn't know about yeast uh, as we know about it, but they knew about leaven, uh, the sense in which uh, things 
uh, particularly bread, um, expands um, through the fermenting process. Um, so the word there, Zume. So it's a metaphor that Jesus uses to talk about the ways that things spread. And in particular, um, in the New Testament, it's usually in a negative connotation. Um, and that's certainly the case here, the way that evil or nefarious things spread. And so what's spreading? Um, what the Pharisees and Herod are up to, that they're, they're about to put into action something that's going to um, lead to some bad, bad stuff for Jesus and his followers. So he's trying to warn them about this happening, and they're thinking he's literally talking about bread. <laughs> well, it's only because we have... Well, in fact, they, they actually exaggerate. We have no bread, despite the fact they have the one loaf. And so then he goes on this rhetorical rant of questions. Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Do you still have eyes but do not see? Goes on and on, asks them about the bread um, from the last couple of um, miracle stories. And they're like, yeah, I remember, but I don't really remember. And then we have this interaction with a blind man. Um, remember this interaction with the disciples. They, they kind of remember, right? They remember the 12 basketfuls. They remember the seven. But they don't fully understand. So then we get to this story about this blind man. Jesus enacts a lot of the same sort of um, things that he did with the deaf and mute man. Okay, the touching and the spitting happens again here. So again, maybe a sign of the, the mimicky-ness of what the, the healers at the time are doing. Uh, but uh, this one is unique in the sense that he has to do it twice. So the question naturally is why? Like Jesus hasn't had any problems healing people in the past. In fact, we just read a story about <clears throat> Jesus not even in the presence of this girl and, and she's healed. So why does it take two times? Well, Mark has got a purpose for telling it to us this way. Okay. Um, so he pulls the man aside again, like the, the last healing story, although not completely private this time, because as the man says, I see people, they look like trees. So that's interesting. Mark uses oh, just great storytelling right here. Mark uses multiple words for see just in this little passage. And they all help illuminate what he's getting at here. So the first one is the word blepes. And, and it's pretty um, basic. It's just seeing in a physical sense. So we see that in verse... Uh, it's when Jesus asks him, do you see anything? Do you blepes anything? So can you see anything physically? The very next word, the response, actually, well, yeah, the physical response of the blind man is this next word. It's somewhat related. Um, it's got the same root, anablepsis. It's what NIV translates as looked up. Um, literally, the word means, anam means like re or recover. 
and blep meaning see, so it's recovery of sight. So Jesus asks, do you see? The man attempts to look up to have recovery of sight, and he looks out, and he blepaces some people, but they look like trees. So he touches them again, touches his eyes again, but this time, when his eyes are opened, it's described as diablepsin. So it's what NIV translates as eyes were opened. And it can also be defined as looked thoroughly. or clearly. To like see through something even. So Mark says, this is verse 25. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. That's diablepsin. His eyes were opened. His sight was restored. And then he saw everything clearly. One more word here. Enablepin. So even so there's a sense of seeing through and a clearness of diablepsin but enablepin is even stronger like not only clearly but there's a spiritual sense Um, another way you could define it as a, a sort of penetrating insight. It's closer to, sometimes we'll use the word to see uh, as synonymous with like understanding something, um, particularly understanding something metaphysical, something that's kind of beyond what we would typically be able to see physically. That's the sense with enablepin. So, so let's like walk through, can you see physically? He looks up to try to see physically, and there is some recovery of sight, but it's not clear. So he kind of sees, but not the whole picture. So again, Jesus touches him, and this time his eyes are opened, diablepsin. And he could look thoroughly. He could look with clarity to see through things. And again, not just in a physical sense, but even beyond it, so that he could, in a blepin, really see in a spiritual sense. So it's not just that he's recovering physical sight. Mark is saying he really sees what's going on here. And it's, yes, and it's so it's a metaphor for what the disciples are going through. That's why I said pay attention to what we just had as we go through this story, right? The disciples, when they get called by Jesus, they know this is something pretty significant. Rabbis don't just come around and call fishermen to be their followers. So they know it's a big deal. And they, and they start going wrong, and they, they see that he can do some really amazing things. But they don't really, they don't diablepsin yet. And they don't enablepin yet. They get anablepsis, but not enablepin. Does that make sense? 
That's why Mark tells the story that way. And, and so it's not so much the case that Jesus didn't have the power to heal him the first time. It's he's, essentially, it's an acted out parable for the disciples and for us. So also, you know how people, Jesus tells them your faith has healed you, you know, you have such great faith, and yeah. the woman who touched his cloak. Yeah. In the beginning, it was the people that brought the blind man, and the people, it seems like, were the ones begging Jesus. The blind man was just kind of like along for the ride, so I wonder if that had to do with where he was in his faith as well. So, um, not that Jesus couldn't, but was making a point for the blind man, too, because maybe he didn't think much of Jesus up until that point. He was just being dragged along. Yeah, that's that's possible. Of course, Mark doesn't tell us his the man's thoughts and insights on who Jesus is. But it's the people begging Jesus. Yes, correct. That is true. Yeah. But remember what happened uh, the last time that we had an instant, well, not the last time, but one of the first most prominent instances where uh, a group of people bring the paralytic to Jesus. Jesus says their faith. So not just the paralytics, the whole group's faith. So there's a sense in which the, the faith of an entire group of people uh, matters to Jesus um, and, and has an effect upon um, what Jesus does and how he um, brings healing and salvation even to individuals who um, maybe in this case, he doesn't know. He doesn't, he, I'm sure. We, and, and we don't know because Mark doesn't tell us. But yeah, great point, great question. Any other questions or, or thoughts or insights? Are those same words used in the other uh, instances where Jesus heals? The, the, the seeing word. words? Yeah. Um, so this is, interestingly, this is actually Mark's first time healing a blind man. Or Mark, Jesus' first time in Mark healing a blind man. Um, I'd have to go and look at how the other Gospels describe it. So in verse 18, when he says, do you have eyes but fail to see, is that... It's probably... Yeah, uh, uh, yeah I need to go look. I, it's probably blepes because that's the one that's most common. Um, so, yeah, I'd be... I, I'd have to look for sure, but I'm, I'm going to guess that it's... Base, but it probably in that context is not just physical. Yeah, he's using it metaphorically. It could be that he's using diablepsin. My Bible I'd have to look. something interesting about that. It says that Jesus was using this as a teaching moment for his disciples, that not all healings are instantaneous. And that could be. I don't think that's really what Mark's trying to get at. I, I mean, it, it's kind of a byproduct. Yeah. yeah, I think I think what it, Mark is really trying to convey to us is this is uh, a metaphor for the disciples currently that they don't clearly see. They kind of see. Yeah, but but yeah, certainly that's a possibility, and many scholars have argued that. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, really quickly, I know we're a little past eight, um, but we haven't had great opportunities uh, for most of the classes to talk together about what this actually means. So my question to you is, so what? So what? Okay. Okay. Why do these stories matter? What does it mean for us today? <laughs> the Greek sure does help, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I wish, uh, yeah, I wish English translations would do a little bit more to help us understand that one of the priorities that English translators generally have is they want to convey things as succinctly as possible, and because we don't always have the exact same words. Um, it's hard, in, like in this particular story, to convey all that I just conveyed to you. It took half an hour for me to describe it. Yeah. Yes. Which is why it is so frustrating.
frustrating when certain groups of Christians take the position that we are all to take the Bible literally, and in fact, they don't know what it literally means. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, what I tend to tell people is that we're invited to read the Bible literately. Does that make sense? Like we take into consideration the different aspects of the literature, the different genres, right. the metaphors, the irony. And of course, it's a different language. And so uh, the way that things are communicated are different than in English. And certainly there are aspects of the Bible that even in English ought to be taken literally when they are direct instructions from God to us. We should uh, read those as literal. But in stories like most of what we read tonight, we have to do some work to interpret what they mean so then we can apply them. And so it's not so much the fact that we should, for example, take the story of Jesus healing this blind man and saying, oh, Jesus, whenever he heals blind men, it always takes twice, right? That's not the point of the story. That would be a literal reading of that story, but that's definitely not what Mark is trying to convey. I guess it is kind of interesting that there wasn't more of an effort made in the interpretations and the, the uh, translations to make it more understandable, I guess. Yeah, I... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I kind of pick on the translations at times, uh, so maybe that's partly my fault for conveying <laughs> that they don't do enough, because really they, they have an incredibly difficult job to do, to take languages that are 2,000 plus years old, um, with Hebrew obviously much older, and try to convey to us in English what is trying to be conveyed in Greek or in Hebrew. That, it's really challenging to do um, in the first place. And then, as I mentioned, one of the priorities is to try and to do it in a way that is succinct and understandable, and, and is, it just is hard. And so NIV, as we saw, they didn't say see every time. They said see or looked up uh, or see with clarity. Um, again, be, in part because these words can be translated that exact way and seen physically, as, like they, they could be translated or seen just from a physical standpoint. It's the greater context that helps us to see that, oh, it, he's not just talking about physical eyes being opened. He's talking about a spiritual sense of that as well. That, and so that requires an understanding of the fuller context of the passage. Um, and so for a translator to convey that, they'd have to put in like notes every single verse, like refer back to how this story went and that's how you should see how this word is being utilized in this context. Yeah, it would, it would be challenging to do. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, it's also why you have multiple translations, because each translation is going to go about these in different ways, um, and in particular where you have um, things like what's happening in this one story where you have multiple words describing a, a similar idea. Different translations are going to give you a, a whole different sense of what's happening, and so in comparison between all those translations, it can help um, give you a fuller picture of what's happening. So in your own biblical study, I recommend have multiple translations with you. And I re recommend having translations from different um, types of um, purposes in mind in their translating. Um, so what I mean by that is uh, translations like the NRSV, the NASB, the New King James Version, they're what we call word-for-word -word translations. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to take each individual Hebrew or Greek word and translate it one-to-one -one as best they can to what uh, the, the appropriate word would be in English. But freer translations, 
what they're typically called, or more um, general or um, don't really always like to use this word, um, but um, uh, and now I'm spacing it uh, where it's like a prayer. Thank you. Paraphrase. Uh, so translations like that. So like the message, uh, the New Living Translation, the Passion Translation is a little bit more on that side of the spectrum. They're, what they're trying to convey is less word for word, literally, and more of a general sense or general idea of what's happening within the passage. Um, which is why uh, when you read the message, for example, and um, you're in John chapter one, where in NIV, you're gonna see the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. In the message, you're gonna see Jesus put on skin and bones and walked around the neighborhood. <laughs> but that's literally what, that's actually what the passage is trying to convey. Eugene Peterson perfectly depicts what um, the context of John is trying to convey to us. It's just that um, he's taking it from a little bit different approach than um, what these other translations are trying to do. And then um, the NIV is kind of right in the middle, um, Common English Bible, kind of toward the middle, a little bit more toward word for word. And that's part, partly why I read from the NIV, um, because it's an equal opportunity offender. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it tries to do it word for word, and sometimes a little bit more within the general context of what's happening, the idea a more like a paraphrase, um, so I can I'd pick on it uh, a bunch more. Yeah. I so. see the, that last four words there as a stage of Christianity. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, you know, being born, or born again, it's a Christian. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would argue that. Um, if we're thinking about it in stages of Christianity, the diablepsin is where we're getting to a sanctification point, a sense in which uh, we have given all of ourselves over to God, and in giving all of ourselves, God fills us more fully with the truth, with who He really is. So, great connection there, Tim. Yeah, and and a, and a great response for the so what. Yeah, that that definitely applies. Yeah, well done. No, that we're doing the homework together today, so that's the point. Any other quick thoughts before we wrap things up about um, what this means? Why why should we care about what we just read tonight? How does it apply? I, I just had a thought about the, you were talking about translations, and you didn't mention the one that will drive you absolutely nuts: the uh, the amplified Bible. Oh yeah. It's absolutely wonderful, but it, you know it'll drive you nuts because it'll ha it'll have ten words where these other versions have one. Yeah, <laughs> right. And that's actually kind. They're they're trying to do kind of what I think Mel was kind of asking yeah. for Bible translations yeah. to do. Yeah. 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 But but as far as trying to read it through as a narrative, it's real hard oh, to read. terrible. Yeah. So it's a good way so. to use. Yeah, yep. Trying to understand more, so. Particularly if you're trying to word study. Yep. Mm -hmm. Specific words. Amplified's good. A lot of these are translated from one language to another language to another language, and then to, finally to English. Whereas you take a word or a phrase 10 year, 20 years ago, and it's still the same language. You can't translate it. Yeah, actually, English translations of the Bible, they're, they're pretty much going straight from Hebrew to English or Greek to English. There has been a history, certainly, of one language to another language to another language. Um, so, for example, sometimes when New Testament authors, when they quote the Old Testament, they quote the Greek version of the Old Testament rather than the Hebrew version because that was what was common at the time. So there'll be a, like a slight difference in how that New Testament writer quotes that passage because English translators are quoting straight from Hebrew 
and then in the New Testament, straight from Greek, and so uh, they're just subtle variations. Yeah, so there's a little bit of that happening, but actually not a whole lot, in, in at least in Bible translation, there's not a whole lot of that happening. Um, in the Catholic Church, a little bit more when you're trying to translate from Greek to Latin to English, um, which happens um, a little bit more, more in the liturgy, less in biblical translation, but yeah. Well, for me, I think I'm the, not necessarily the so what, but understanding things I didn't ever understand, like how the Pharisees, um, the regions, that they went to being Jewish or Gentile or whatever. I did never know that kind of stuff. That's that's very interesting to me. And the legal aspect, because like I've said before, the era that we were in the Nazarene church and how legalistic it was. And, you know, and I guess maybe... You should you see the connections, right? Between oh, the Pharisees absolutely. and how oh, Nazarenes yeah. have been in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And not, I'm picking on Nazarenes because I am one, uh, but obviously other folks have been legalistic, not just us, but, but yes, yeah, right. Yeah. For me, the, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. And you can see where maybe some of that legalistic stuff came in because of these things. You know, it wasn't just, not necessarily that somebody decided these things, but I think one that kind of struck me last week when you were talking about the daughter that was dancing for the okay. king, you know, so with that in context, you can see why they're saying no dancing, you know, <laughs> <Yeah, right. laughs> in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That was yeah. a little different spin on it. Yes, it does. <laughs> you didn't want somebody's head yeah. on the ladder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and, and, and related, so the context of the no dancing comes from their own interpretations of what's happening culturally in that moment, in the 20s and 30s. Thank you, Tim. Yes, a lot of that dancing was very sexualized, at least from their point of view. And where a lot of dancing was held. Bars. Yep. You know, yep. Right. <laughs> yep. Jennifer, you have that. Oh, just real quick. I have to watch how judgy I get with the disciples because I've been walking with the Lord for a long time and I can still visualize him sighing at me. Don't you get it? Haven't I brought you through this? Haven't you been with me when this happened and this happened and these miracles and this timing and all the things? And then I still get in places where I doubt and I'm afraid and I'm like, but do you really have my best interest at heart? You know, and, <laughs> and all the things. And so he's just so gracious and patient. Yeah. And yeah, it's funny to me that I could be inserted in there and then it wouldn't be so funny anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that gracious and patienceness is key because Mark wants us to identify with the disciples. This has been a problem throughout all of Christian history and prior in Jewish history as well. People who get it, but they don't get it. Right, and so we make silly mistakes that we shouldn't, and yet God is still loving and caring, and and continues to pursue us and woo us and want to have real relationship with us. So, yeah, in one sense it should be like oh, I'm just like that, and in another sense it should be thank God that you still love me when I'm just like that. Great point. Great point. And a great point to end on. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for sticking around a little bit past 8 o'clock. But we did our homework together this time. So don't write me anything. Unless you want to, and that's fine.